Great. It is now the top of the hour, so I want to welcome everyone to the Association of Moving Image Archivists webinar. Uh, before we begin, I want to make sure that everyone can hear me. Um, if you look in the control panel, I'll ask you to raise your hand if you can hear me loud and clear. There, uh, great. See some hands going up. Uh, there's an icon with a little hand. If you can just raise your hand uh, to let us know that you can, in fact, hear us. We'll begin the session momentarily. Great, it looks like most folks have located the control panel and the little hand. So um, I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon and uh, morning for some of you. You have all joined in listen-only mode due to the number of registrants that we have on the phone today. And on the left side of the control panel, um, you'll, you'll see an opportunity for you to access materials for this webinar. Uh, depending on whether you're joining us through the web version or through the uh, desktop version, uh, there's an icon that looks like either a piece of paper uh, or the word materials. And in that tab, you can access both a participant frequently asked questions document as well as the presentation that Nadia will be delivering today. We will be advancing through the PowerPoint presentation for you so that you can um, move forward with us, so you need not download that presentation at this moment, but it is available for you. Okay, so uh, I want to welcome you to the call and uh, let you know that this is the first of our uh, small audiovisual archives webinars. Uh, my name is Kimberly Tarr, and I'm speaking with you all today from New York City. I'm going to be serving as the webinar producer for this session. Uh, and which is an introduction for small audiovisual archives. Um, and before we dive into uh, the webinar, I'd like to provide some logistical information to assist those of you who are less familiar with the GoToTraining webinar interface. I know some of you have joined us for past sessions, so this may be a review. But for those of you who have not joined us before, um, the control panel that you see in front of you uh, offers a chat box. And in that chat box, you can send a message to the entire group or to the instructor directly. Um, we will be taking questions. We've made sure to reserve some time at the end of the session for questions. But if you have a pertinent question that comes up um, during Nadia's talk, please feel free to send us a, a note via chat. And although um, this is a listen-only uh, webinar, we do want to hear from you, so please feel free to send along comments and questions via the chat box. So Nadia will tackle your questions um, as they arise, if she's able to in her presentation, or we will address them at the end. So we have um, the presentation in front of you here, and uh, I'd like to introduce you to today's uh, instructor for our session, uh, Nadia Vassetti. Um, Nadia is the head of the Visual Media Research Lab at Washington University in St. Louis, which is comprised of the University Library's Film and Media Archive and Modern Graphic History Library. In this role, she oversees collection acquisition, preservation, digitization, cataloging, scholarly and public access, and outreach. She's been with the university for eight years, working primarily with the film and media collection. Nadia has developed and taught workshops on film identification and care for local archivists, students, and professional organizations. As principal investigator, she recently completed the Eyes on the Prize Preservation Project, which was a four-year project funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to complete the film preservation of part one of the award-winning documentary series and associated interviews. She's currently the PI for the NHPRC funded project to digitize and digitally reassemble the newly preserved Eyes on the Prize interviews. Nadia earned her master's in, library, in, I'm sorry, in information science and learning technologies from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and a certificate in film preservation from the L. Jeffrey Selznick School of uh, Film Preservation at the George Eastman House in Rochester, New York. She holds a BA in Communication Arts and a minor in Classical Humanities from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm very delighted to introduce Nadia to you all today. And at this point, I will turn over the reins to Nadia. Welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I would like to thank Kimberly for that introduction as well as being today's producer. And I'd like to thank you all for participating in the Association of Moving Image Archivists Online Continuing Education Series. So as, let me be sure I am, there we go. So um, as Kimberly said, my name is Nadia Gossidy, and I'm the head of the Visual Media Research Lab at Washington University in St. Louis. So it is somewhere, uh, that's somewhere in between the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, in the Midwest. So uh, today I will be presenting this introductory webinar for the series, Best Practices for Small Audiovisual Archives. And uh, before we really jump in, I do want to acknowledge and thank the content developers for their months of very hard work putting the webinar presentation together. And they are Eddie Calatun, Marie Lascu, Yvonne Ng, and Lauren Sorensen. So I definitely want to acknowledge them. And also, uh, I want to just reiterate what Kimberly mentioned regarding questions please feel free to use the chat feature throughout, especially if you're seeking clarification or something I've said or something that appears in a slide isn't quite making sense. And um, I am going to try very hard to, um, to explain as much as possible. As a professional, it is sometimes difficult to not use lingo and, and I don't want to make any assumptions and please do not feel that um, any question is silly and uh, I do encourage you to seek clarification. There's going to be a lot of content to cover, a lot of um, potentially very new things, so it can be overwhelming, and uh, we will have plenty of time, hopefully, at the end. And again, if there's something we can't address, um, my email will be at the end, and please feel free to, to email me with questions as they arise. Okay, so. Seems to be a little bit of a delay when I hit the button. Okay, so a brief overview of what we'll cover today. We're going to, to really just be focusing on AV format identification, so different video, audio, and film formats that you may have in your collections at your organizations. However, we won't be going over every potential format. There are additional formats and you can learn more about those formats by um, looking at the PDF of different resources that we've provided in conjunction with the webinar. So I'll just be reminding you throughout uh, of that point, I by no means want you to think that anything we're presenting today is at all exhaustive. And we're also going to be talking about um, some really best practices and basics when it comes to then managing this type of material, material um, for today's user as well as the user in the future. So since we've talked about what we will be covering, I will also be, uh, I also want to mention what we won't necessarily be covering today. Um, there's some exceptions, but on the whole, we won't be discussing digitizing audio and video materials. We have a webinar dedicated to just that topic on Thursday, and I hope you are all registered for that since this is um, the other kind of half of this in, an, in a very important complimentary webinar. We also won't be diving greatly into born digital audio and video. Um, and these are and this is a very important and very relevant topic, and it's something you know very worthy of its own series even. Um, and born digital content is really all the content that, that only exists digitally and has never had an analog surrogate from which it originated. And, and as the list kind of shows here, um, this includes files saved on floppy disks, CDs, DVDs, um, the, all the content on your phones, your digital cameras, your digital recorders, and also all your social media presence, so tweets and things like that. Um, again, this is something that really is worthy of its own webinar, and that's something we hope we could we could offer in the future. But a lot of the principles we'll be talking about today uh, can be applied to the care and management of born digital content. So, who is this webinar for? 
Now, when we say small audiovisual archives, you know, we don't want to. We don't necessarily mean small uh, as in terms of collection size. We may mean small in, in, in terms of infrastructure or financial resources or perhaps even your uh, staff's backgrounds um, that you might not have a active AV program in place or preservation program. Or you might be part of an institution that maybe doesn't even have an archival mission or, or a subsequent preservation plan. So you might find yourself um, with a lot of AV materials, actually, and that the collection in itself is not actually that small, but uh, there's really no space in your organization uh, to potentially hire someone with those specific skills. I'm going to go back for a second when I said preservation plan. I do want to um, define some things here before we proceed. And I, I want to point out that when we're speaking about audiovisual materials, preservation really has two definitions. In broad terms, preservation is the stabilization of materials through activities like inspection, proper handling, appropriate storage. And this is done in order to prevent further damage and to slow inevitable deterioration. Now, that's kind of a general broad definition. But when we talk about uh, film, video, and audio preservation more specifically, we often are referring to transfer. So for film, preservation is considered transferring unstable nitrate or acetate-based stocks, which we'll talk about more later, to a more stable polyester stock. And in, again, we'll, we'll talk about this later. But that is something that um, I often always have to remind people that are less familiar, that film preservation is technically transferring to new film stock. Now, video and audio tape preservation primarily refers to the digitization process. Transfer to new tape, quote unquote, isn't really preservation because many of these tape formats are obsolete. You know, we can't even we can't even buy the new stock or um, new capture and playback equipment is no longer manufactured. Therefore, the only reliable format to transfer video and audio to is a digital format. And you can learn more about that process, of course, in the second webinar. But it's something I definitely want to um, be sure that you all feel comfortable with as we proceed. So, beginning with format identification. In order to understand and describe what you have, you need to be able to identify the various formats of audio, video, and film that you could potentially have in your collections. And uh, very importantly, you also want to be able to know the difference between video, audio, and film, and uh, be able to, at the very least, speak to that. Now, I want to note that the vast majority of video and audio that we'll discuss today is considered magnetic tape. And magnetic tape and film are two distinctly different categories of moving image content. Now, if you want to enrage a moving image archivist, use the terms film and video interchangeably. The two are, are very different processes. They're created with, under very different processes. Film is photographic. It relies on light sensitivity, chemical processing, and persistence of vision, whereas tape relies on its magnetic coating to store electronic signals which are imprinted into the tape surface as it passes over a recording head. These are very simplified explanations, but I want you to, to walk away from this webinar knowing that video and audio tapes are different from film. And we'll, we'll be able to delve di more deeply into identifying those differences. But they do have different qualities, they have different histories, different uses, different storage requirements, different signs of deterioration, and as we previously discussed, different forms of preservation. For film, it's transfer to new film stock, and for video and audio, it's digitization. Now, again, I will, I will say that film-to-film -film preservation is the professional standard. However, 
it's not always going to be the option for especially smaller organizations that don't have an infrastructure in place to really manage that kind of preservation or to even store uh, newly preserved materials. And that's something we can certainly address. And uh, Rebecca has asked that um, I write down some of these differences in the comments, and I, and I can certainly do that later. I'm happy to do that. So another thing <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, I want to be sure that you all feel comfortable and have a basic understanding of the differences between uh, analog and digital before, you know, let me go ahead and advance to the next slide before I get into this. Uh, when we talk about video formats and some identifying characteristics. So the first thing we're going to talk about is analog or digital. And now I'll go into my, my spiel about analog versus digital. So I want you all to have a basic understanding of the differences between analog and digital media. And to help us better understand this, I want to break, break down video, audio, and film to their essential function. They are methods of storing information. How that information is stored determines if the media is analog or digital. So analog media captures through a photographic process or an electronic process a representation of the information that is analogous to the original. For example, film stores actual visual representations that are analogous to what your eyes see. So if I were to to, to shoot some film of a building, uh, the information stored on that piece of film are going to be very analogous to what my eye saw, that actual building. On the other hand, digital media converts those images into numbers and then stores the numbers rather than an analogous representation. Again, this is very, very simplified, but uh, I don't want to just throw those terms out and have others uh, feel as if they're not quite understanding. Now, does, does anybody need any clarification? Or I know this is a lot, uh, a lot of, of new definitions. And uh, if anybody is confused, please don't don't hesitate to to let me know. So, uh, with video formats, we can have analog versus digital. And I know that we we said earlier that we weren't going to really be covering digital and we and and we kind of lied but um, we're not delving deep into digital the, the only reason that we really are bringing it up is because uh, you need to know the differences and you need to know that digital formats do exist so a uh, video can uh, store either analog or digital signals and that is something that you will likely see Video can also be stored on magnetic tape, like a VHS, or it can be stored on a disc, like a DVD. Another, another difference is that videotape can be housed in a cassette, also like a VHS, or it can be open reel. And I should say when I say video, I, I should say tape, but we'll, we'll talk about that too when we go to audio. Or in an open reel um, that is exposed, and we'll look at examples of that. Also, the tape width is another um, identifying factor. Often, tape is referred to by its width, such as one inch or two inch, and we'll see examples of that. Videos can also come in different sizes. And uh, again, we'll see some various sizes. We look at our examples. And the date of use. Date of use can really help you identify your materials. Because a lot of formats died out as newer, higher quality replacements were developed. So that's something else to also consider. And finally, uh, and certainly not least, it's important to know the context in which your video was created and used. Were videos created professionally or by amateurs? Or were they made for broadcast or another specific use? And knowing the format can really help you determine that. If you, if you if you otherwise don't know. So let's go ahead and start with some of the analog video open reel. So open reel formats were developed for professional use and they're the, among the earliest 
format used. And I'm going to actually start, um, and you know, yeah, sorry, this one label right here, if you can see, was cut off. So I apologize. I'll tell you what that says in a second. Uh, in the center right here is where I'm going to start. And this is two-inch quadruplex videotape. And you'll often hear it called two-inch quad or just quad for short. And this was the first commercially successful analog recording videotape. And you can't necessarily, you can see the size of the entire reel here. Um, but what you can't really tell from this image is the width of this tape. It's two inches. It's quite large. Um, and that's why, why it's, it's often recalled or called two inches because it's that width of that tape that's wound onto that hub. So quad really it was it was adopted by the broadcast television industry in 1956 by Ampex and it really changed television since we no no longer had to rely on uh, films for recording broadcast television. So this was a huge, huge, hugely impactful format and it's something that especially if you are dealing with any kind of uh, media station, public media or news station, um, you may have or any kind of television, uh, you may have this material in your collection. Now on the left of this is the one inch type C and this is a professional reel-to-reel -reel analog recording tape that was co-developed and introduced by Ampex and Sony in 1976, and it replaced Quad as the, the standard for uh, professional video and broadcast television. And it did that for several reasons. One, as you can see, it's smaller. Um, it's still not, uh, I wish we had like a pencil in this picture because it's still not super small. Um, but the tape width is, as you can guess, is one inch. Um, and again, I do want to remind everybody, this is not exhaustive. There are other types of one inch. It's just that type C was the most dominant and really became, for almost 20 years, the, the, the mainstay for television and video production. Um, so it's smaller than quad, but it also had, uh, it was much easier to use and it wasn't as difficult to set up. And there were also some features that, that one inch offered that quad could not. And that's uh, trick play functions like shuffling and like slow motion. So things like that really made type C the dominant format for the 20 years after its development. And then again, that was replaced by other, other formats that we'll also discuss. Now, all the way to the right here, is an example of half inch video. And I apologize, so that says half inch CV slash AV. So CV was, was really the world's first home videotape recorder and recording medium. And it was introduced by Sony in 1965. And the CV stood for consumer video. And it, you, you may have heard of the term porta pack um, and that's also what this was referred to as. So this was the first portable video recorder. And uh, it was aimed for the home market, but as you can imagine, it was still expensive and it was mainly used by businesses and educational institutions. And AV, when we say AV, we're talking about an, a later format that really standardized uh, this, this home half inch videotape. So it was, it was, you could more freely play it back on various tape recorders and it could be more widely adopted as a result. So you might, you might hear the term um, EIAJ and that is a half inch video that was uh, widely adopted by businesses, schools and governments and hospitals and, you know, through the 70s. Things like, you know, maybe your town meeting was recorded on EIAJ. Another area uh, that, that really adopted this format was public access television. So that might be things you have in your collections. So it was, um, you know, obviously portable and it was lower cost than the other large uh, 
video open reel formats like type C and sorry yes so okay let's go let's move forward to some hopefully more familiar formats oh sorry I think we have a question so uh, in the mid 60s CV was introduced in the mid 60s and then EIAJ was introduced in 69 with the 70s kind of being the dominant period and when it was used. Thanks for that question, Jessica. So analog tape, uh, videotape cassettes. So VHS, hopefully you all still remember VHSs. Uh, they were developed in the 70s with by JVC and it stands for Video Home System and they reached their popularity in the 1980s and 90s and had a variety of uses including um, home video distribution. The one thing I do want to mention here too as we start to talk about videotapes and all these different uh, cassette formats is the idea of generation loss particularly with analog formats. So. Um, Often VHS, at least in the collections I oversee, are, are duplicates and they're dubs of other material. And with that, with every transfer, some quality is lost. However, that's not to say that original VHS don't exist. In some cases, there were camcorders that you put a, a VHS in directly and then that became the original recording. So these are all things you want to consider. You know, don't just disregard a VHS in your collection as um, something cheap and of low quality because it, it could very well be the earliest generation and therefore the only um, uh, existing copy. So these are things you, you definitely want to consider when you are making evaluations of your collections. So Umatic, as you see in the middle here, this again is an analog recording video cassette format and it was presented uh, by Sony in 1969 and wasn't introduced to the market until a couple year, years later in 71. And it's a, uh, among the, f the first video formats that were, that existed inside of a cassette uh, as opposed to the, the real to real examples we've seen up to now. And so the video, the video tape inside a Umatic cassette is three quarter inch and so you often hear this format uh, referred to as three quarter inch or just three quarter um, as opposed to one inch and two inch. So this was originally intended by Sony to be a consumer format uh, and this didn't quite work out. It was uh, really expensive to manufacture and therefore the, the the retail price was high and of their VCRs. However, it wasn't prohibitive for, again, industrial uh, and other types of institutions to adopt this format for business communication, educational television. Um, and as a result, this format became heavily used in those uh, private, industrial, and professional, and even educational sectors. And so Umatic, in the in the mid 70s also saw some um, great use in the broadcast industry particularly because of the model of electronic news gathering it was much easier and faster to record on umatic than to uh, if you're going to run out and try to cover a story than to do so on 16 millimeter film which required uh, a time to develop and uh, it's just more prohibitive. So this this really, this format, we have a ton of it in our, our collection and depending on what type of institution you have, um, it it's, uh, was a pretty popular format, I think. Yes, okay, great. So beta cam, seen here on the right. Uh, and I wanna, I wanna be sure that, uh, people aren't confusing Betacam with Betamax. And some of you might be familiar with Betamax as the format that lost the home 
Video Wars to VHS. And uh, they do have actually some similarities, but at, at the crux, they are different formats. So, so don't confuse Betacam with Betamax. So the uh, so so Betacam. This is basically a, f a family of video cassettes that were that were developed by Sony, and they are half inch. And there's different versions that you're going to see. And I want to point this out just so people see here. And also another thing with identifying tape, like you can see here on this example that it actually says Betacam on it. So that's also a huge indicator. You know, look at your cassette, see what it actually says, because um, that would be the number one giveaway uh, as to to what format you're dealing with. Um, there's also a Betacam SP, and then later we're, we are going to look at a digital Betacam. So uh, there, another thing. Here's here's where sizes are going to come into play too. The cassettes for Betacam um, are also available in two different sizes. There's an S for short and a long, an L for long. And again, like that's what they stand for. But the S is smaller and the L is larger uh, because they had more tape because they recorded um, more content. So uh, that's another thing. Don't assume because the size, the sizes are different, that they're necessarily different formats. So in 19, uh, what year did I give you the? So I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. In 1982 is when Betacam uh, came kind of into play, and then in 1986 the Betacam SP was developed, and this had uh, improvement in the. See, what, what, a pattern that's kind of happening is sometimes like the format itself, the tape uh, quality increase might have been minor, but in, but the actual improvements were really with the videotape recorders, and so that's where a lot of these changes, the the, the driving factor, um, were the recorders, and maybe not so much the tape. And also, Betacam SP came with larger cassettes um, with the 90 minute uh, recording time. And I should mention, and it makes sense, that the SP does stand for superior performance. And Betacam SP really became the industry standard for TV stations and other high-end production houses until the late 90s. Um, and, it, and it is a standard definition. Uh, it really was a, the common standard for standard definition video post-production into even the, the 2000s. So I'm going to go to, oh, th oh, sorry, I totally have neglected my chat. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for answering that. Yes, sorry. VHS is half inch, but yes, as Kim has mentioned, it is rarely referred to by its width. So yes, sorry. I apologize for my, for my lack of focus on the chat box. So, okay, so let's talk about uh, some other, now, again, this is where we've become liars, and I don't want to confuse anyone as to why we've included digital videotape and discs when um, we're, we've said we weren't going to include them. Uh, but they're worth mentioning, and this is why. Because these things, even though they're, they store digital information, they're still physical things. Not that a hard drive isn't a physical thing, but um, there's still tapes that are going to be mixed in or discs that are going to be part, you know, store, stored on a shelf that have uh, similar concerns as far as handling as, uh, as their analog counterparts. So you can still you know, jam your mini DV if, you, you know, if it's not um, handled correctly or are played on uh, inappropriate deck. So it, it's definitely worth mentioning. And MiniDV and DigiBeta are, are still magnet, are stored on magnetic tape. So that's very similar to anal, their analog formats. And we also just want to be sure that, you, you know, again, this is a demonstration of the differences between um, 
an analog and digital. They might look the same in this instance, but there, there are uh, differences in how that information is stored. So don't make an assumption just because something is, is a physical that it is, an, is, that it is analog. And again, you know, disks, they're physical things that you don't want to store, uh, you know, in extreme heat and, and things like that. So they do have preservation concerns based on their physical makeup. So mini DV over here on the left, um, you can see it's slightly smaller than three inches long, and it's about two inches high, so to speak, I guess. Um, so DV is a format for storing digital video and it was launched in 1995. And so DV can come in, in many different packages, so to speak. And so the small cassettes, um, or as you might know them as, is uh, the mini DV cassettes, were intended for amateur use, um, but they also did become accepted as professional productions, uh, in production, sorry, in professional productions as well. And, uh, <clears throat> And they could hold about you know one hour of video, so it's not like if you um, are a university, let's say, you could very easily have recorded guest speakers, things like that, on mini DV. So DVD is an optical disc storage format, and it, it was was brought to the market in 1995, and it can store digital data, so it can also store computer files and, as well as video programs. Um, and DVDs, as, as you I hope are all aware, you know, replaced VHS as really the primary format of distributed home video. Um, but it's very likely that you have this format, even if it's not part of your archival collections, you, you know, you likely even in the capacity of your, you know, office um, have DVDs lying around. So DigiBeta, you know, which stands for Digital Beta Cam, which we just spoke about, um, was launched in 1993, and uh, it, you know, supersedes both Beta Cam and Beta Cam SD. Um, and it, it's a lot more affordable, and it can last up to 124 minutes uh, if they're the large. Again, there's a, a, a larger format and a smaller. There's the, the long play and the short play. So that's something you also want to be aware of. Um, just because you have a small tape and the large tape does not mean they're different formats. They're both digital beta cam, even if one is uh, much smaller. And these are, uh, they store uncompressed, sorry, what am I saying? Let me proceed. Okay, sorry, I am somehow, oh, I know what's going on. I apologize for that. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. So let's move on to the audio formats and identifying characteristics uh, that are actually very similar to video. Um, again, you can have analog or digital. You can have audio that's stored on a tape or a disc. Also, you can have audio that's in a cassette or it's also open reel. Um, tape width is something that can also come into play. I mean, it's not as, uh, I wouldn't say that that tape is often referred to uh, by its width, uh, audio tape, sorry, and other than for the instance of quarter inch, which we will discuss. Recording speed is also something, um, particularly with record. And again, size and shape, you do have um, instances of smaller, more compact formats that are arguably the same formulations as their larger counterparts. And again, date of use, there is a, there are formats that replace others and, and knowing um, that can help you date your materials. And of course, there is also context in which certain formats were used. And uh, that can also help you determine 
perhaps um, the context and the use of the materials in your collection if you don't have a lot of that information otherwise. Okay, so some of the common audio format. Uh, the first is the quarter inch open reel. And it's called Open Reel um, for the same reasons that the video was called Open Reel, Reel is that it's not housed in a cassette. Um, and this is a prime, primarily for um, I yeah sorry. So Open Reel was first developed um, really for dictation and. Again, it was it was then used later for because um, of the quality. The quality really was best for voice, and so it was never adopted as a as a standard for the music industry. Um, so that's something. If you have one thing that we have in our university archives, our early um, we we have a, something called the assembly series. So since the 1940s, we have had different um, notable individuals come and give lectures and then all of those speeches were recorded on quarter inch audio. Um, also the original interviews from Eyes on the Prize which were filmed on, on 16 millimeter. The audio components, um, the audio was recorded separately on quarter inch. Um, again because these were just uh, being used for voice. So the audio cassette um, was actually also developed for dictation, but it rose to popularity with um, Sony's Walkman, as you can imagine. So it quickly did become the standard as far as uh, music distribution. And if you, any of you remember uh, Teddy Ruxpin, if you're of my generation, you will also know that they were used to make animatronic toys come to life. So the 8-track tape, you know, it was a magnetic tape sound recording technology and it was popular in the mid-60s into the late 70s um, and then the, the audio cassette really took over and it's considered obsolete today and it was, it was housed in a cartridge and as you can see in this image and uh, it would easily jam, that was one of the, the drawbacks. And I will, I do want to mention, particularly with the compact audio cassette, that uh, there are other sizes of this. There's the micro cassette, which you might recognize as um, uh, the, the tape often found in answering machines. And so finally, we're going to look at some non-magnetic magnetic examples um, with records. So records are often categorized by their diameter and RPM, which is uh, revolutions per minute. So the 78 is about 10 inches uh, wide. And that was really the industry standard uh, in the 1920s. And this is, and these were mostly made of shellac. So that's what you're seeing on the on the left is a shellac and, and that can really get brittle and, and they break as a result and they need to be handled very carefully. And then the, the LP, which stands for long play, which uh, were introduced in 1948, they're comprised of polyvinyl chloride and those were 33 and a third RPM and about 12 inches. And they're still really still considered the standard, standard vinyl record format. And then there's also 45s, um, which were seven inches, and they're they're of the same era as the LP, but um, they were smaller and just featured singles. So, okay, CDs. Hopefully, again, CDs are something that you all are familiar with, and even if they're not part of your technical collections, you you I'm sure have some sitting around. Um, so they're, a, again, a digital optical disk, a, a data storage format similar to DVD, um, and it was originally stored or developed to store and play sound recordings. 
But again, as you might uh, guess, as, uh, with CD-ROMs, later they were they were adapted to also store data. So the the, the DAT, sorry, the T got somehow moved down. So a DAT, uh, again, this is uh, an example that that proves that we're liars. It stands for uh, the digital audio tape. These are all digital. So I mean, as, yeah. So uh, the digital audio tape and this was. This was meant to replace audio cassettes, actually, as the standard, um, but it didn't really catch on, and it ended up primarily being used by professionals. So um, it really, they really look similar to an audio cassette, and again, you see here it says DAT on it, so you know, um, and, it, and even though it's digital, you, would, you might look at this and think you can play it in an, in an audio cassette player, but you can't, so don't try. Um, uh, so it's important to know that difference. And then the mini disc on the right, um, this is a magneto optical disc-based data storage device. And so it doesn't, that disc doesn't come out of that little um, container. So it's basically like a cartridge and that similar in size to a floppy disk, and you would insert this into a uh, uh, a player, and and they could be blank or they could also come pre-mastered. So it's that's another format you might have in your collections. Um, I should mention they were also on the market from 1992, and they kind of I guess phased out as late as 2013. Okay, so we're now going to be moving on from video and audio and start talking about film. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, film is different from video and audio, and um, we'll, we'll start to kind of talk about that more. So similar to a tape, though, uh, film, film is often identified by its gauge. And by gauge, we mean its width. Um, and, and here we talk about millimeters. So 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, 8 millimeter, those all refer to a film's width. And that's, those are the formats. Film can be black and white or color. And that's something important to, to know. Uh, there color film fades, um, particular types of color film fade more. Uh, if you have any film in your collection that you're like, I don't know what this is, it just looks really pink, that's um, very faded color film. Um, I've had uh, certain people bring that kind of film to me and say, I don't know what this is. Um, it's, co it's faded color film. So um, that's not, it's probably, especially stuff from the 70s, late 60s, 70s, you um, will see that. Another important thing to be able to identify about your film is identifying whether it's positive, negative, or reversal. So I, hopefully you all kind of have a sense of what positive and negative is. You know, you start with a negative, and then from there you make a positive, and then from there you can make another negative from that positive. And again, that concept of generation loss that we talked about earlier in terms of um, making dubs from VHS um, is also true for film. So every new generation you develop, you have some image and quality loss. Now reversal film, I always kind of describe this as the Polaroid version of film. Um, the film never exists as a negative. And a lot of home movie film formats are, are reversal. Um, you can imagine why, you know, you don't need, why, why, why shoot a, a home movie of Christmas morning and have a negative and then have to pay to get positives made? Um, you really just care about that one film. You're not interested in making a lot of copies of it. If you're not going to make copies of it, then the original can be straight to, to a positive image. So it's a different process for development, and it's really important to be able to 
to know if what, what you have on your hands is reversal because it's misleading. You see the image and the image is positive and so you might assume that there's a negative somewhere and what you have is a second generation. But in reality, that could be the original and the only, you know, if, if you then go and uh, project it, uh, you might damage it and therefore ruin um, the only the most original copy. And, and uh, the next slide, we'll look at examples of each of these, and I'll point out to you ways to kind of identify these things. Uh, also, element type. So there are different terms that we use in uh, the moving image archives field. When we talk about a print, we often are talking about a, a positive film that has a soundtrack. So it's something I can go ahead and just kind of view it's not a, a, pr a production element. It's not something that 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 exists um, as an intermediary to get to that final. It's kind of the final thing from a camera negative. So a camera negative is clearly something um, that was in the camera, and it was that first earliest generation thing from which the print is derived. So then you need all these intermediate. If you're doing things traditionally with a negative and not using reversal film, um, you need to have these intermediates in order to get to that print. So um, an inner negative, for example, if I made, uh, if I wanted to shoot a film on negative, camera original negative, I would then from there make an inner positive and let's say I, 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 I wanted to, to make a lot of prints. Well, I can't go from an inner positive with a positive image to a, an, another print, which is a positive image. So I would then need to also make an inner negative, and from that I could make um, my prints. So um, you can't go, in uh, theory, you can't go from negative to negative or positive to positive. Now, reversal does kind of throw a... a uh, throw a wrench into that to that plan because reversal does enable you to do that. However, um, reversal has separate costs and separate processes. So reversal, as far as uh, we talk about, you know, industry-wise, you know, is not really being employed as a as a way to cut corners if you're talking about distribution of a, a Hollywood film um, that would not have been efficient. So you do need those intermediates. Um, however, some independent, you know, filmmakers might have used reversal um, in order to cut some corners. Uh, so I, I've already touched kind of on uh, implying that a print has sound, so film can have um, a soundtrack, and that soundtrack can be magnetic, very similar to the tape that we've been discussing. Um, there's a brown strip literally on the edge of the film, or it can be an optical soundtrack, which is developed with light. And there's two different types of optical soundtracks. I just see, sorry, I am neglect. You know, Kim is on top of it. So, wow, thank you. Sorry, I also had failed to see that other question. Um, and uh, so optical soundtracks, there's, there's two different types. And they're, again, we have an example on the next slide. Um, the optical soundtracks can either be variable area or variable density, but the important thing to know is that it's going to be alongside the image, and in the case of op uh, optical or vari variable area, it looks honestly just like sound waves, and there's different types of these tracks, and uh, I'm not going to get into the details of that, but um, know when you see that, that's what that is, and um, density literally, it's all, you know, with Area, the louder the sound, the higher the wave. And then with density, the, the darker uh, the image, the louder the sound. So it's almost like a, like, it looks almost like a barcode in ways with the darker areas being louder. Uh, I wish, I don't believe we have an, an example of variable area, or sorry, variable density. Gosh. Another important thing to know about your film is is very important, particularly with uh, preservation, um, is its base. So film has a base, and again, this is a, this is a simple uh, simplification, but there's a base and an emulsion. So the base can be either made from nitrate, acetate, or polyester, polyester being the most stable and what we now today transfer nitrate and acetate-based films to for preservation. Uh, another thing about a film is date. 
and I uh, don't know if we have the Kodak edge codes as part of our resources on the PDF. Uh, I believe we do link out to uh, some really helpful resources that, that then include um, things about edge code. But edge code um, and the date of the film, it's really, it, that's going to tell you when film was manufactured. So it's definitely useful as far as dating that particular piece of film, but um, don't let that confuse you. I've had many people come in and tell me that they have like this super old film that's really important, um, but you know, I know for several reasons it's actually, you know, the content itself, it's, it's, it's a, it's a derivative. So um, it was made on a film stock much later. So brand and stock, uh, Kodak, Fuji, these are all uh, brands and we'll primarily, you know, be talking about um, Kodak most likely as I talk about the edge code, which is a, a code that Kodak, Kodak used. Um, and stocks are different. Um, Really different formulations of that emulsion that we that we uh, I, as I mentioned that the bases can be nitrate acetate or polyester and then the stock are different um, emulsion formulations so that's a really a lot of information that um, I unfortunately feel like I sped through so uh, let's look at the next slide and now let's talk about um, now I looking at these examples and identifying some of the stuff we just talked about. I don't know if I'm, let me make sure I can proceed. Hmm. Is that not, I don't know if I still have control over the PowerPoint. Let me see if I can help. Just one moment. Thank you. I think I might have lost control in more than one way. Does anybody have any questions while we're working on reassigning me power? Oh, over the, let me see, did I do that? Um, does anybody have any questions about the film stuff? We're going to look at some examples uh, in just a second that hopefully can, can help you visualize some of the things that I've just been talking about because it's a lot of information. Okie dokie. Okay, great. So I now have control again. So let's look at some um, examples of film formats. So um, in the center here is the 16 millimeter that uh, I mentioned. And one easy way, no one expects you to be carrying a ruler around to measure the film width. Um, 16 millimeter is, is usually about uh, the width of your finger. And um, 35 millimeter being almost twice as wide is about two fingers. And then eight millimeter being half the size, 16, is just about half of your finger. Um, so these are all things that are kind of quick ways to identify these formats. Um, 16 millimeter was introduced uh, by Kodak in 1923. And uh, it was solely acetate based. Um, at that time, and it was referred to as safety, as were other smaller formats. Again, there are other formats of film, but we're focusing on these three as, as they're most likely the ones you'll have in your collections. So um, they, because nitrate had risks, um, including its uh, incredible flammability, uh, acetate is also flammable, but not uh, to the same degree in which in which nitrate is. So um, these were primarily used for educational reasons, for um, home movies, 
you know, for for film screenings in church church basements, things like that. Um, this example you see right here is a silent 16 millimeter. Um, and one reason is that it's a negative. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, I know it's a negative because it's a color negative because it has this kind of orangish tint. So that's something um, you definitely want to be able to 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 uh, recognize that orangish tint. You might be like, wait, is this a color? I don't know, but it's, it's a color negative. Um, another, uh, so it wouldn't have a soundtrack on it. Uh, but I do want to point out that um, even if it weren't a negative, this is what the film would look like um, if it were silent. Uh, another thing I want to point out is uh, another way to know if the film is silent is that it has these perforation holes, which we call perfs, on, on both sides. If it were to have a soundtrack, it would have to eliminate one of these um, rows of perfs in order to accommodate enough room for the soundtrack. Um, if we look over here at the 35 millimeter, because of its width, it can accommodate a soundtrack, as we see here. And this is a optical soundtrack, more specifically. It's a variable area. As you can see, there's little like sound waves. Um, and uh, Regardless of the presence of a soundtrack, it has perforation holes on both sides. Now, uh, if you aren't confident that your, you know, your fingers are really, you know, oddly shaped, that you cannot identify uh, the film based on that kind of thing, uh, one other indicator is that there are four perforation holes per the frame of the image for 35 millimeter. And as you can see. Um, 16 and 8 millimeter just have um, the one. Now, you might have also heard of the Super 8 film, and that's a very common uh, home home uh, movie format. And it's also 8 millimeters wide, but what makes it super is that the perforation holes are smaller, um, which allows for more image area and also enables the potential for a magnetic soundtrack. So that's um, an improvement. I should mention that um, 8 millimeter 2, it's a smaller format for home use. That would also be acetate based. So the only nitrate film that you would have would be 35. So if you don't have 35 millimeter, you shouldn't be worried about having nitrate. Um, uh, certainly there can be nitrate still negatives, but that's something different. But as far as motion picture goes, if you don't have 35 millimeter, there's no way you have nitrate. Um, if you do have 35 millimeter, uh, and depending on its its age, it could potentially be nitrate if it um, is from before 1951. Uh, it is most definitely nitrate. So those are important things to know. And again, if the film is nitrate, it often says nitrate right on the edge here, um, where you can see that this says film. But I'm probably giving way too much detail here, and I should proceed. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll hopefully we'll have, uh, if I keep this up, we won't have any time for questions. So I will keep going. Um, and if there's more about film you want to know, I can certainly uh, work to answer that. So let's move on to management. This has been a lot of information you've been given about various formats. And it's going to be, you know, it's intimidating. It's hard to know where do I start. Um, and there's plenty of, of tips and advice I can give you, but really it's going to come down to your organizational mission. I really can't emphasize this enough. Um, if, if, you're, if you can't make a connection between the materials you're overseeing or um, their use with the objectives of your organization, then it's really going to be hard to find resources to support uh, to support the ongoing care and maintenance of your materials. Uh, so really finding those ties and and figuring out the priorities. If you're a university, then maybe it's those um, film, maybe it's the football films, maybe it's um, things that are documenting the history of the university. Maybe that's first and foremost. So those are the things that you need to you need to determine. You also need to consider who your users are. Um, in our instance, you know, we have a, a variety of users. We have the faculty, the students, um, but we also have the general public, and primarily we have a lot of documentary filmmakers. So these are all of our different users, and I need to find ways that um, I'm ensuring that our collection is meeting their needs and expectations. 
Um, and you also can use this as leverage. You know, these are all things that you can share upward to your management. Um, when you say we've had you know, X amount of inquiries about this type of material, and that can always give you some, um, some proof as to why your, your collection is, is needed for preservation or digitization. Um, budget is also something that, that you must consider. Uh, it costs money, unfortunately, to, to do these things. And uh, hopefully you can use things like your mission and your user needs um, to, for leverage, again, to your administration to get money to, to, to manage your collection. Um, and last but not least is a collection policy. Now, if I would be, I would actually be very surprised if you have AV materials and kind of none of the infrastructure to deal with them. Um, well, you might have a collection policy, particularly if you're like a university archive um, and that AV materials are just kind of thrown in there. But um, you need to know if you do have one, first and foremost, and what it says and, and, and how these materials fit within it. And also, if you have one, one of the beauties of having a collection policy, um, you use that as a, uh, as a kind of, I don't know if defense sounds um, like, you know, negative, but you use that as a defense as to, as to why you need to have these materials. You, you show that um, that's proof as to the reason you have them and the reason you need to continue having them and making them accessible. So these are all things um, you need to consider on kind of a big picture scale. Now a bit more, oh, oopsies, nitty gritty is is thinking about the an assessment. So before you start figuring budget and all these other things, you need to really get a grasp of what you have. So um, you're going to want to basically form an inventory. And that should be able to address how many things you have on what formats, which we just went through many examples of the different formats, um, how they're uh, is it just you know a a basic? I mean, if we're talking about an assessment. We're talking about kind of a uh, in, in addition to something like an inventory, you would also just have a short overview of the collection that would include you know things only exist in an inventory, or there are more uh, there's more information about each item. Um, how is the material organized? What is the overall condition? Where are they located? Are they in a basement somewhere? Are they in someone's office? Um, and also, we you would also want to talk about the rights. You know, are, is there any are, the, are these materials that are all owned by other people as far as the rights, the copyrights go, and the other types of rights that can be tied to materials, or are these things that maybe your organization own? And again, these are important factors to consider when you're um, hoping to increase access. So some um, common risk factors you also want to be aware of are um, physical deterioration and more specifically with digital files corruption, which will be discussed more on Thursday. Um, and the format obsolescence that I did mention before. And here, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, largely about the playback equipment. You might still be able to buy specific formats, like even now you can still, um, I believe, go to Target and get a CD, but um, I don't have the CD player anymore. Um, th these are something, these are things that are becoming less and less ubiquitous. So those are things that are problematic. I mean, even if your material is in great condition, but you have no machine to play them on, that is a huge risk at losing that information. There's also proprietary formats and other technical dependencies that um, can make it, uh, as well as encryption and digital rights management um, features that make things hard to read. If you don't have the right type of player installed on your computer, um, one thing that we've dealt with quite a bit is we inherited a FileMaker, FileMaker Pro database from a donor that is basically a catalog of all of the materials. However, um, it only exists in, in FileMaker Pro 5, and in order to open it, we need FileMaker Pro 5. And as the university continues to, to upgrade, you know, we have to be sure to maintain these you know, legacy versions of these systems. And also, you know, an inability to locate, locate your media is problematic. If you can't find it, you might as well 
you shouldn't own it. <laughs> you don't you don't own it. If you can't find it, it, it doesn't exist. So um, that that is certainly you know having some kind of um, arrangement of your materials that can be uh, interpreted by others is incredibly important. And also um, another risk is that you're not properly identifying for the reasons that we just mentioned. You don't uh, put a DAT take. Don't don't try to play a DAT in a uh, in a uh, audio cassette player. Um, you don't know that something is film, therefore you, you're continuing to, to store it improperly. These kinds of things are all risk factors. Now I'm going to uh, really give a, a simplified, uh, the, I'm going to really just simplify this. <laughs> so copyright is also something that you really have to um, consider and it's a very complex issue and something that I certainly cannot address in uh, just a slide here in a 90-minute webinar um, but you need to to do uh, the due diligence to determine what rights you have to your collections um, so copyright really gives the creator of the work the rights to reproduce to um, prepare derivative works to to distribute those copies, um, and, it, uh, and if it's a you know not a moving image, or oh, actually no, sorry, with a moving image to um, perform the work publicly. So you can't necessarily just screen a film um, if you don't own the rights, um, and that's also true with other types of um, media such as uh, sound recordings. So you can't. You can't necessarily just have on the web a sound recording if you don't own the rights to it. Even if you, um, even if you owned the tape that it was derived from, you can't necessarily make it available outside of your your physical premises. So these are all things that you need to consider. You also need to, you know, be aware of public domain and works existing prior to 1923. Um, fall into the public domain, at least uh, AV material. So copyright is very complex, and there are exemptions that libraries and archives have, um, and those are in Section 108. And again, um, these it's, it's Section 108 uh, is complex, and there are certainly areas that are vague that leave, leave uh, leave things open to interpretation, but as um, archives and libraries, when it comes to moving image and sound, we are able to make um, preservation copies within um, certain limitations, but the, those are rights that we do hold, and that's something you need to be aware of when considering uh, preservation. And now I'm going to jump back to these underlying rights, something else that you want to be aware of outside of just copyright. Um, we, as um, Kim had mentioned, I've been working on an Eyes on the Prize interview project, and we own the copyright to this content, which is great. However, the participants in those interviews, um, they, they also had rights and they signed release forms, and some of them made certain requirements and had certain stipulations that would influence how their interviews could be used. And these are things we need to consider. Just because I own the copyright means that, you know, doesn't mean I can't, um, uh, that I'm not obligated to uphold the um, agreement made between the interviewer and the interviewee at the time. So these are all things that, that come into play. There are also rights to publicity and rights to privacy, <laughs> which complicate things um, even further. And I, I don't say this all to overwhelm you. Um, but I, I, I say it so you know uh, that these are areas that are worthy of investigation and, um, and uh, you know, we have an obligation to our profession and to our institutions to work within the parameters of the law. So if your institution does have a legal counsel, um, I definitely encourage you to seek their guidance when it's appropriate. Um, and just I want you to be aware that copyright is real and there are issues um, that exist with it before you kind of delve into um, or propose some project that is promising certain levels of access that you really can't promise. Okay. 
So <laughs> metadata, again, it's one of those uh, complicated things that um, I'll do my best to simplify. And hopefully you all are familiar with the term metadata. It's often defined as data about data. Um, and there are different types of metadata. And in parentheses, you see here um, examples of different schemas um, that address those types of metadata. So administrative metadata often uh, captures the context necessary to understand um, the creation, acquisition. It's also um, data about the rights um, and things like that related to your materials. Uh, descriptive metadata is um, it's used to help users locate and distinguish select materials on the basis of the material subjects. And it's really about the aboutness of the content. So um, think about things like the summary, the date, like who's in it, subjects. Those are all things that are descriptive metadata. Um, structural metadata, I, you know, the best, the best way I, I think of structural metadata, if you think of like DVD chapters. So it's basically a way to, to record the relationship between parts of an object. Um, and technical metadata um, describes the different processes used to produce um, or the different things that are need or that are required to, to utilize a digital object most specifically. And um, preservation metadata is also um, specific to information about an object used to protect that object from harm, injury, deterioration, or um, destruction. And a lot of times that can be um, sometimes um, linked to, uh, it's again, technical information, I guess is what I'm, I'm trying to say. So um, it's also can have information about migration. Again, that's a little bit more digital than, um, the, that it, than we're hoping to dive into with this particular webinar. So um, ways that you can manage all this metadata are things like collection management systems, um, you know, which is just a fancier way of saying a database. Um, but you can also do this as simply with a spreadsheet. So we don't want to, you know, you don't feel like, oh, I have to buy the, the, the fanciest collection management system in order to, to manage my AV materials. Um, there are open source systems available, and, but even if those are, are a bit overwhelming, even a spreadsheet, something as simple as a spreadsheet, can um, meet these needs. And we have an example here for you of a PB Core, which uh, example, and I do want to uh, remind you, this is a descriptive metadata. So you see here um, your you know, title, there's an identifier, so um, that's going to differentiate this particular um, item from any of the other items that exist. And uh, again, you know, think about metadata and following a standard. It you know, it's always always uh, you know recommended. It helps your metadata and your content speak to other systems. It makes it easier to transfer from one system to another. Um, but again, you have to do what's best for your institution and what your budget allows, what your resources are. If you don't have people to manage something, you know, it might not be the best um, path for you. And you know, you need to just, so much of it depends on your institutional um, requirements and your inst institutional capacity and limitations. So I will quickly discuss um, to you some issues relating to condition. So um, it's important to know the state that your film and audio and video are in um, in order to prevent biological, chemical, and me mechanical deterioration. And when I say biological, um, I want you to think about things like mold and insects. Um, when I say my mechanical, think like rips, tears, and breaks. Um, often from you know poor handling or faulty equipment and when i talk about chemical i want you to be aware of um, different types of breakdown of film and video in the case of video it's something called sticky shed syndrome and it's the breakdown of the magnetic tape binder it causes the tape to get gummy and if it's uh, if it's played, it leaves a residue on the video player guides and heads, and in severe, severe cases, it can actually cause a magnetic coating to separate from the tape base. Um, the, so the chemical deterioration of film um, 
if it's acetate-based, is called vinegar syndrome. And it's called that because um, as the film base begins to break down, its acidic uh, acid levels increase, and it emits a very strong vinegar smell. Uh, in that case, too, uh, it can be as severe, so severe that it can burn your skin. I've never seen vinegar syndrome that bad. I've only seen it kind of make you, you know, your eyes water. Uh, but as it, and also another thing you should uh, become aware of is that as film deteriorates, it loses moisture and solvents and plasticizers and all that good stuff, and be, it begins to actually shrink. The spaces in between the perps get smaller, and the film becomes brittle. So um, because of that, you should never just assume a film is ready to be put on a projector and viewed, because it could um, have shrunken, and therefore you could really cause some serious damage. Uh, I don't want to forget about nitrate film, which is also considered unstable. It doesn't get vinegar syndrome, but it does have five distinct stages of decomp. Um, and it kind of starts with uh, discoloration of the emulsion, and it ends with the film literally turning into a, a powder. So um, these are obviously things that are a concern. And as a result, we want to keep our media in cool, dry, dark, and clean environments, um, in, a, in the case of magnetic media, away from magnetic films. So um, that's always a difficulty if you don't have a climate-controlled space, but you know you can do certain things like invest in a, in a uh, dehumidifier, things like that. Um, you also want to put you know, your materials in a place that, that, that have minimal fluctuations of temperature and humidity. You don't want it you know, drastically changing between seasons if you can prevent it. Um, using archival containers is important, particularly in the case of film. Um, you don't want film to be, uh, you, film needs air, it needs some air circulation. So it's short, don't keep film cans shut, don't do anything like that. Um, if your films do smell, uh, if they're acetate-based and do have vinegar syndrome, it, it is best to separate those films out from your other films as well. Um, and uh, another important thing, very simple, is just videos, um, open reel or not, you store them like a book, and uh, films, you store like pancakes. So, and as you see here, this note at the bottom, uh, you know, deterioration of, of this, all of this content is, is arguably inevitable, uh, but good storage can prolong the life until you're able to digitize your magnetic media or transfer your film to uh, new uh, film stock. So this has been a lot of information I know. And last and certainly not least, um, you don't want to forget about access. And I want to I emphasize that everything you know, related to preservation um, really goes hand in hand with accessibility. We don't we don't preserve if we don't want people to access this content, not only today, but you know, in 100 years. So access, um, sorry, preservation without access is pretty pointless. Um, and therefore, even when you're talking about film preservation, which is film to film, digitization of some form is usually essential in order to, to, to make your materials more viewable by a wide audience. But if you're going to, to think about an access plan, you, you do need to, again, come back to that question of who your users are. What are their expectations as to how they're going to experience your collection? Um, how will they search your collection? What kind of data do you have available to even make it discoverable? Um, what level of access will you provide? Are you restricted by rights? Or can you share it very broadly because you own the rights? And these are all important things to consider. Um, and also, then, if you're talking about the level of access, how will they actually get to your material? Um, is there, are you going to put things online? Do you have infrastructure for that? Are you going to use a web streaming service like YouTube? In which case, I highly recommend that you always familiarize yourself with the um, user agreement policy. You might, you might be giving YouTube and other um, similar uh, providers a certain license to your content. Uh, you might think, oh, I'm the copyright owner of this, it's okay, but by using YouTube, you might actually be um, giving them certain uh, licenses to use your material. So these are all things you want to consider and, and keep uh, at the forefront of your mind. Um, if you can't put things online for rights 
issues, for infrastructural issues, you know, how, do, how can somebody come to your space and view your content? These are all things that you, you want to consider when you're thinking about managing your collections and also making any arguments upward to administration for additional support. So this really uh, wraps up our first webinar, and I apologize, this is a lot of information, uh, and there will be even more information on Thursday um, when the second webinar happens, and it's all about digitization, so I do encourage you all to participate. Um, I thank you all for, for participating uh, today, and we do have a little bit of time for questions, but there's also my email address here. Um, and everyone, anyone's welcome to email me with any questions as you know, maybe something occurs to you later. Um, I don't want you to forget about the resources, uh, PDF. And um, I also don't want to forget to thank AMIA and all of those involved in making this series possible. They are listed there. So I can go ahead and open it up to uh, questions. I know this was a lot of information. So. I believe the resources PDF. Um, if you okay, Actually, it's going I'm to be stop added. In, Nadia. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Thank it you. looks like there were a couple last revisions uh, to the resources PDF, and uh, I will be adding that momentarily. Um, so, folks, if you haven't accessed it already, it will be in the materials tab uh, here. So, uh, look back in in just a couple minutes. But we do have a, a few more minutes for Nadia to tackle questions. So the question, hopefully you all can see it. Um, so Phil, like so, certainly like the best way to store film is freezing it. Uh, but that also, um, if preservation is completed and you have access copies and you have the infrastructure to to actually uh, pay for freezing original film, yeah, like that's awesome. I would definitely recommend that. Um, if you haven't, if you don't have access copies, then freezing it does present an accessibility problem. You also have to keep in mind, it's not as simple as like throwing film in a freezer. Um, you need to be sure that um, you have staging spaces that help acclimate that film to room temperature and you don't want condensation and moisture to build on the film itself. So there's certain, you know, steps you want to take. You don't want to fill you don't want to freeze um a video. Uh cold storage is is uh good, but you definitely don't want to freeze video. Um, as folks think about um, additional questions to pose to Nadia while we have her on the line, uh, I just wanted to remind all of the participants today that the session has been recorded and you will be able to access this uh, webinar recording in the future. So the EMEA office will be sending out information on how you can access um, what is ostensibly a video file with uh, uh, Nadia speaking and the presentation um, in sync. So it looks like Barbara has a question. So I think, you know, and this is a more outside my realm, we do have some upright um, storage boxes, archival storage boxes for phonograph records. Um, now if you're, I, so I think for vinyl that is acceptable. Uh, I think for the shellac, which do get brittle and break more easily, um, a, a more like a pancake would be. And you also have to be mindful of the weight. Like you don't want to, um, if you have uh, records, you don't want to stack a whole bunch. But um, vertical. Yeah. And I, if do you have, I can jump in too, Nadia. In. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think for all audio, um, you'll want to start upright, vertically, um, on its end, like a book. The only exception, um, there are some very rare. Um, kind of plastic discs that are not vinyl. They're much more flexible. Mm -hmm. They are kind of uh, like usually five to seven inches in diameter. Um, and those you would want to store flat. But your vinyl records, your shellac, your lacquer, 
you'd want to make sure that they're upright, but in proper archival storage boxes that, so that they're supported. Um, oftentimes, we recommend um, shelving units um, that um, ensure that they are able to stay uh, vertical and not slumped over. So not just records on the shelf, but ideally records right. upright in archival boxes as well. Well, on behalf of EMEA and the Education Committee, I want to thank you so much, Nadia, for you fit so much information into a 90-minute period. So, uh -huh. I tried too much. It was a very, yeah, no, no, it was a really dense, um, dense session, but I think that there's a lot of great information for folks to unpack, and I know if they have questions that come up um, in, the, in the short term, they can undoubtedly... Yeah. Um, email you. The, the um, email address is up on the screen. Um, the recording will soon be available, as will uh, the resources PDF. So we'll make sure we get that um, out there um, to all of you. So um, I wanted to thank you so much and, and thank give you. you an opportunity if there are any final words. Yeah, no, thank you all for participating. Again, that was a, lo was a lot of information, and I appreciate you uh, uh, hanging in there, and uh, thanks to Kimberly for for being on top of it as a producer, and to Amia. So uh, again, please feel free to email me if, if you have any additional questions. Great. Well, thanks to everyone for participating, and we hope to um, have you in our session again on Thursday. So two days from now, Lauren Sorensen will be tackling digitization. Great. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.